All right, so this is going to be a pretty long session, so settle in, make yourself a cup of coffee. This is going to take some time. I'll try to structure it, make it a little bit fun, come at it from an angle. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the shaders. The stuff I was saying before about layout sets, that'll make more sense when we look at it in the context of how it's actually going to be used. So we'll just go to the vertex shader and I'm just quickly scanning through. So we can see here we have the uniform buffer object and the storage buffer. I'm just going to add an extra qualifier here called set to make it explicit that these belong to the same set. Otherwise, yeah, that's good. Then I'll add an extra attribute here, which will be the texture coordinate. And of course that will be location two. Okay. And I'll specify that I am outputting a um, texture coordinate to the fragment shader as well. And that will be attribute one um, vector two. Okay, so pretty much all I need to do down here in the code is say, all right, um, take that vertex texture, <laughs> vertex texture coordinate, pass it along, no modification. Okay. So just quickly check through that. Yep. That's looking good. So that's the fragment shader, uh, the vertex shader done. Then I go to the fragment shader and I'll just say, all right, all right, fragment shader, you are taking in the color and you're also taking in the, um, texture coordinate. Now, in addition to this, we have another um, resource. So we'll say, okay. Now this will be in a different descriptor set. And like I was saying in the previous video where I talk about how this all sort of fits together, the previous video in this playlist, this could be the same descriptor set. There's no reason if I were to bind the texture once for the, the whole frame and then draw everything, I could still do this in set zero. But because I'm binding this a little more on the fly, it's a different set because it has a different um, binding frequency. But anyway, so I'll declare this in a different set. This is a uniform. It's a texture, so that's the sampler 2D type and it's going to be called material. Okay, so the way I use this is I'm going to um, sample from the texture, so I'll use the texture function. The texture I'm sampling from is material. The texture coordinate I'm using is that uh, fragment texture coordinate. And multiplying it will just blend the pixel with whatever color was coming through. Okay, so just double check that. I think that's fine. I'll just go ahead and open up. Oops, open up the folder, go over to the shaders, get rid of the old shaders and compile the new shaders. That's come through. Okay, fair enough. So that is how the shaders um, are put together. I'm just doing this in chunks because the other day I recorded for two hours and then the video got corrupted 15 minutes in, 16 minutes in. That's no fun. So the next stage is how do we, um, do we have to make any adjustments to accompany that? And as it turns out, we do. Um, and this is a little bit esoteric. So if I jump into the Vulkan Mesh namespace, here I have this file which really just describes the general um, layouts. Now, I'm not going to have five floats anymore. So in here, binding description, the stride will not be five. It will be 
seven. So I had a two dimensional point, that's X and Y, and then a three dimensional color, red, green, blue. That made the original five floats. Now, in addition to that, I'm also gonna have U and V, or S and T, as they're sometimes called, for texture coordinates. So now I'm going to have seven floats, so my stride will be seven. <clears throat> and in addition to that, if I go to the model vertex menagerie, there's this point at which, so a vertex menagerie, it represents a whole chunk of um, vertex data. When it consumes a chunk of data to get the number of vertices, it takes a number of floats, divides by five. Well, now our stride is seven. So it will be seven floats per vertex. Okay. But that's all the change we need to do with the vertex menagerie. It's a bit frustrating. You set your system up and then it doesn't, it sort of looks like it should, but it doesn't quite look like it should. It's just um, those little things need to be changed. So, okay, now I'm going to update the um, attribute descriptions. So I'm going to add the texture coordinate. That will be attribute two. Of course, it's still bound at the same thing, but we're going to be at location two. And now going to be, yeah, it's, what? There we go. Come on. What? Ah, uh, capital S. Okay. So the way Vulcan works, as I've said in the past, is it's, it, it doesn't have a nice, for format, it doesn't have a nice, like, VEC2, VEC3. Instead, it just assumes red, green, blue alpha channels up to four. 32 bits per channel. So what I'm saying is I have a 32-bit component and a second 32-bit component, and these are signed floats. And it's just weird that they call them red and green, even though, you know, they should be like X and Y and stuff. That's fine. Anyway, so the offset, again, at by this point, the color starts two floats into the vertex. It has three components. And so the texture coordinate starts five floats into the vertex. But we've got a problem. And this is just one of those things. I've been a little bit lazy. So I'm going to go ahead and refactor this right now. And here's what I'm going to do. Instead of a fixed size return, I'm going to just return a vector which of course could have any size. But in future, when I add more attributes, the less extra work I do, the, the better. I'm just being lazy. So I do like the absolute indexing that I'm doing here. So what I'll do is I'll just push on a bunch of, um, yeah, you can see what I'm doing here. Pre-populate it and then alter the things. Okay, so hopefully that doesn't come back to bite me, but um, there we have it. Now, what else is I gonna do? Well, of course, this um, gets used in the pipeline creation. So we'll go back to Vulcan init pipeline. Okay, I was just setting up my, my old code. Okay, so <clears throat> Vulcan init pipeline, and that is... Okay, so here where we make the vertex input info, I'm just going to change this. Okay, and as you can see, it's complaining, hey, um, we don't know what's going on here. So I'll just control click into the definition and change it there as well. So 
The big point to take away here is instead of taking a fixed size array, we take an arbitrary sized array. And then it's easy enough to work with. All we need to do is um, check its size. Yeah, there we have it. Just check its size, cast that to a 32-bit integer, and that should be fine. So I just got an error. Let's pop up the top. Yeah, no worries at all. So what I'll do is just... Um, and there we have it. So fingers crossed, this should now be accepting the layout. And one more thing that I'll do is I'll just close all of this and go back to the engine. And in the engine, there's a function called um, make assets. Yeah, this bit here. Now this is going to have to change. Okay, so these vertices here are the triangle vertices. I'm just going to use these ones instead. And that is just including um, texture coordinates on the end. That's all I'm doing. So I'll do the same thing for the square vertices. I made these ahead of time. It's just not a lot of fun to sit here and type them out. And the same thing for the star vertices. What I'm also doing with these vertices is if you look at the positions, like these X coordinates here, for instance, when I put in the new ones, I have doubled the X and Y coordinates, just scaled everything up by two, made it a little more visible. Okay, so now I guess I'm going to start looking at the image, but I'm not going to implement the image just yet. I'm just going to write the basic structure and show how the engine is going to use that. So we can go ahead and close down this function. That's fine. And actually, we'll probably use that in a second. But um, anyway, we'll go to the view and we'll right click and we'll add a new folder. I'll just call this Vulcan image. Now, see down here, I've got this STB image header. This is the, the popular and famous library, which is very good. Um, I'll just go to my project and add that in. So I'll add existing item. There we go, that's in the project. And then I'll just drag that into the image folder. Okay, and then in here, I'm going to add a new header. I'll call this image.h. Okay, so for now, I'll describe a just a high level description of how we're going to use this, um, this file. What I'll do is just include a bunch of libraries. Okay, and then I'm going to have a namespace. And then inside that namespace, I'm going to have a class. Oh, wait a second, this is a bit strange. So the reason I have a namespace and a class, even though both of them sort of do the same thing, is that I'm going to have some general image functions which aren't specific just to a texture. And then in addition to that, I'll have a, a further specialization. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to need a struct to hold the fields used in creating a texture. And um, with the texture, I'm actually going to be storing a lot of fields that you wouldn't normally think to store. For instance, when I go to load texture from a file, I'm not going to take that file name as an argument. I'm simply going to store the file name in the texture as just a, a bit of data. And the reason I'm doing that is to um, reduce the number of arguments in my functions. And there's no reason to do it one way or the other. I just found that a little bit cleaner. Plus, um, Performance-wise, this um, texture loading and stuff, it only happens once, so I'm, I'm not too bothered about that.
Okay, so these are the basic fields that we would use to create or to load something from file. Um, I hope this makes sense. I guess the new one is this STBI UC. As far as I can see, that stands for unsigned character, I think. But anyway, just interpret it the same way as, um, yeah, interpret it the same way as you would a float pointer. It's just an array to the data which has been loaded from the, um, from the file. Okay, now in terms of the fundamental resources that we use for any sort of image that we want to use, we have an image handle, and then we have some memory, which gets allocated and backs up the resource, just the same way as a buffer. Then we have an image view, and the image view is an abstraction over really all of this altogether, if that makes sense. And then we have a sampler object, and then the bit that we send to the descriptor set references both the image view and the sampler. It's called a combined image sampler. Okay, so here we have just the standard resources. What I'm going to say is that every individual texture has its own descriptor set, and we just bind those in as we need. I'm also going to add some command um, handles, because the texture is going to need to perform GPU jobs, like um, moving memory around and stuff. But yeah, there we have it. So I'll go back to the, the input struct and I'll say, alrighty, what do we need to construct an image? Well, we'll need a command buffer. Wait a second, I'm looking at the wrong thing in my notes. Here we go, okay, we'll need a device. And of course, of course, we'll need a file name. Now think of it like when we create the texture, we say, hey, here you are, you are a texture, poof, you exist. And this is the command buffer in queue, which I want you to work with. Now, there's a slight difference here, because remember, when we created frames, we made an individual command buffer for each frame. And the reason for that is, well, if one frame is doing work, another frame might be doing different work. We don't want those to mix up with each other. But on the other hand, a texture is a much simpler, much simpler uh, class. And the work that it does, it only does once at creation. And it's, it's fine. It's, it doesn't have to be performance heavy. So what we can do is we can set up that command buffer at the start, reset it ready to go, submit the work and then end it or the other way around end it end recording then submit um, and there's no chance that those command that the it, what am i saying there's no chance that the command buffer is going to be used by multiple textures at the same time it's, it's going to be a little simpler than that so there we have it so you might notice something a little uh, a little odd here is when we go ahead and create the um, the texture, it will need its own layout and descriptor pool, and we can't use the same layout and descriptor pool as we previously made because that's for a different a different set. However, I'm going to simply pretend that it works and then I'll go back and fix it up just in order to not mess with the the flow of this session so let's just pretend that this is working and we'll go back to this um yeah back to the engine back to the make assets and actually I'm jumping the gun a little bit because 
of course, where do these go, right? So I'll just open up the um, engine header and down here, the asset pointers going to have basically a dictionary. So that's an unordered map with key type of the, um, the mesh types enum and value. I'm even, I'm really jumping the gun. I need to import that include, I mean. Okay, so I have this sort of dictionary where the keys are the mesh types. If we go back to the config file, we can see that mesh types has three values. So it's each of these. And with each of these is associated where was I? Which is, with each of these is associated a pointer to a texture class. Okay, so we can go ahead <clears throat> and fill that in. But before we fill that in, I just want to briefly show the textures that I'm going to be using in this session. I go back to, I've got this text folder in the GitHub repo. You'll find this just outside of the, you know, where the third party folder is. And I've got three textures at this point. I've got like an artsy looking face. I've got a Haosu Japanese movie and another one of the best Japanese movies of all time, Noroi. Um, so, right, there we go. I think that's a throwback to my to my original series. I had a Marika Matsumoto photo because I just watched Noroi when I started that series. I thought that was funny. Um, but anyway, so um, we'll just go to my engine. Right down here, after finalizing the meshes, well, the other asset I'm going to make is the materials. So there's a bunch of ways to do this. I'm going to sort of generalize it. So I'll make another um, unordered map. So what I'm doing is I'm essentially saying for each for each type of um, mesh wh what is the file name that I want to load for that texture okay <clears throat> so like I said, I'm going to be filling in some of these other parts soon, but just not right now. So what I'll do is I'll make a descriptor pool. And then I will, um, yeah, then I'll make the, um, the textures. So I'm just making a note to myself, this stuff, it's not correct, but I'm just putting it in syntactically so I don't get any errors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have three textures and the only thing that's going to change each time is the file name. So what I can do is loop through the set up above. So I'll go. Maybe I didn't write the constructor. Um, let me just quickly go back. That's correct, I didn't write the constructor. So for the constructor, yeah, we'll just take in an instance of that struct. And as you can see, this is now working. Now, the next question is how do we use this? So if I just go back. Okay, so for the public functions, 
What do we want to do with the texture? Well, we want to use the texture. And when we use the texture in drawing, we want to know which command buffer is recording those draw commands so we can slot it in there. <clears throat> and as it turns out, to bind a descriptor set, we need to know the pipeline layout of the, the layout of the pipeline that we're binding to, as it turns out. So we also want to free the texture, and we can handle that in the deletion function. Okay. So I won't write those just yet, but I'll look back at the engine <clears throat> and how we can use things. So this is how we create the textures. Now, if we go here to record draw commands, <clears throat> note that a lot of this code looks the same. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to break this out into its own function. So I'll just go back to down below. There we go. The reason I need a reference for the start instance is that inside that function, I'm going to increment the start instance after drawing. So again, the way this function goes is, hey, I say, all right, recording onto this command buffer, I want to draw X amount of this sort of thing. So we can go down below, down below record draw commands. And I'll just grab all of this. And alrighty, so I will query the vertex count and the first vertex based on the object which has been passed in, because as we can see above, that's the only thing that's changing. And then, well, I don't need the start instance that's given to me, and I don't need the instance count that is given to me as well. And as far as I can see, that's it. So then I can go up above and here for the triangles I don't need this but that's just a set at once sort of thing going to render objects onto my command buffer of um, the triangle just passing in those parameters. So then, again, I can simplify the rest of this. There we go. And if I wanted to get more aggressive with this, I could even put another level of abstraction here so that I can just loop through all these object types or something, but I'm happy with this for now. So <clears throat> what I want to do is go go down to the render oops render objects function and this is the point at which i'm going to use the material so i look in my materials based on the object type and that will give me a pointer to a texture and then i'll call the use function on that and i'll pass in my command buffer and my pipeline layout and under the hood this will simply bind the descriptor set of the texture to that command buffer, and then I'll be fine to draw. Again, none of these functions have been written yet, but that's how they will be used. And in a similar vein, if I go down to the cleanup function, I also want to be able to destroy all my textures. So just under delete meshes, I'll loop through. And calling delete will call the destructor function. So I can write my memory freeing stuff in the texture destructor function. 
So that has been a high level view of how these textures are going to be used. Okay, so where I'm at right now is I want to start making the descriptor set and pool for both the per frame resources and the per mesh type resources. So I'll just go to the header and declare these first. So here I have descriptor set layout. I'm going to call this Yeah, frame and yep, yeah, uh, mesh. Okay, so now I'm going to have a bunch of other issues. Uh, I'm just going to go and call this, rename it from layout to layouts, and then deal with the consequences. So I'll pop back here, and we should have a whole bunch of errors. That's fine. So I guess. First things first, in the constructor, I'll change that name. That should now be fine. And then I go down to this function. Okay, so I have these bindings. This is all fine. I'm just going to set that to the... And then I'm going to redo it. But now I'll have one binding. And now this is super important. I made this mistake. In the past, we can't push back onto this because it's a vector. And so I'll be setting thing number three, you know, and then when I go to read it, I'll read off thing number zero and it won't match and it will be confusing. So what I'll do instead, look, I know this sounds super basic, but if I say something, it's because I've, it's because I've made the same mistake at least once. So I'll overwrite the first position and that's what will be read. So this will be a descriptor type of um, combined image sampler. It's just not auto-completing. There we go. So yeah, it's a combined image sampler. There's one of them, we're using them in the fragment shader. Now, as I've said many times, there's no, the reason that these can't just all be together, it's not because they're in different shader stages, it's because they're bound in different ways. So, and I'll go ahead and make the, the mesh set layout. Okay, good. So here we have allocated, created both of our descriptor set layouts. The next error is in making the pipeline because it doesn't understand and it actually needs it needs more. So if I go to the pipeline creation, I can't just pass in one set. I'm going to have multiple descriptor set layouts. So just as before, I'll pass in a vector of them. And again, this will make more problems. So I'll just pop down. I'm down here where I create the layout. Again, I'll take a vector, a vector of layouts. Okay. And that makes all sorts of errors. Okay, so now when I create it, I'll just pass in that vector that was in the struct. And then this is deceptive because it's just not auto-completing. So I'll just pop down to the make layout function. And then as you can see here, I need to set the number and the data. So I'll get the length and the pointer. All right, so breathe easy, that is done. And the reason I'm the reason I'm not uh, running this is previously I ran it and it corrupted my video card and the screen recording stopped working. Let's quickly check screen recording still working. Okay, cool. So um, I need to set a vector. 
me just go actually. So the first one will be the frame and then the mesh. Okay, so let's keep going here. I think the next bit is in frame resources. Yeah, okay. Yep, I'm happy with all of this. I'll make this. But yeah, uh, there we have it. So that part is good. Yep, alrighty. We'll just keep, keep on keeping on. If we go down here, yeah, it's time to, um, it's time to update this. So we'll go mesh set layout. That's now good. That's been created. Then what we need to do is create the, the mesh descriptor pool. So I'll go back up. Okay, cool. So I make a number of, or well, say how many descriptor sets are we going to allocate? Well, it's however many file names exist up above. And there are other ways to do this, but uh, yeah. All right, so happy with that. And now if we go right down to the bottom, I think in the cleanup, it's saying, it's saying, hey, what's this? What is this? And it's also saying, what's this descriptor pool? Okay, no problem. Well, that is the frame descriptor pool that I want to destroy. And then here, I'm going to frame set layout. And I guess after destroying each of the frames, uh, each of the images, I'll destroy the, um, yeah, the mesh set layout and the mesh descriptor pool. Okay, cool. So fingers crossed, that should be okay. All right, so we're getting there. We've described how we're going to use our image, our texture uh, class. Let's tighten the spiral by one loop. So what I mean by that is dig into the texture class and start implementing it. So here I've just described some of the public functions. I'm also going to just thinking, yeah, I'm also going to describe the private functions. Okay, so in addition to this, there are a bunch of general image library functions, which don't really have anything to do with the texture. We can use them anywhere. And, oh, by the way, I'll just quickly step through it. So load will take the stored file name, look inside there, call um, stbi to um, get the pixels from that. Populate will create well, it'll, it'll, it'll create a buffer, CPU visible, load the pixels onto the buffer, and then load the buffer onto the image, more or less. Uh, make view does what you imagine, creates an image view. Make sampler creates a sampler. And make descriptor set will allocate the descriptor set from the, the descriptor pool, which was specified at creation. And then it will write the, basically write the image view and sampler to that descriptor pool. Okay, so in addition to this, I'm going to have a function which makes an image. And allocates some memory and 
um, a function to transition the layout of an image. And yeah, okay. So then I'll keep working at this. So for the make image view, this is going to take a device. For the other ones, the other functions, I'm going to create structs to define the data that they'll take, the arguments. Okay, so there we have it. This struct will be used in creating an image as well as allocating its memory, as we can see down below. So I can go down and say, okay, for make image, and then the same for make image memory. But in addition to that, I'm also going to use the image that I'm making the memory for. All right, now for transitioning the image layout and copying the buffer to an image, those are jobs which need to be recorded on a command buffer and then submitted on a command queue. And so I'm going to use a struct to represent that piece of work. Okay, so there we have it. We grab an image, we want to transition it from some layout to another one. And we can use that down below. And then for the uh, buffer copying, we'll have another one. Okay, so there we go. We um, yeah specify which buffer we're copying from, which buffer we're copying to, and the dimensions. So we can go ahead and take that as input for that function as well. Okay, so I won't worry about these right now. At this point in time, I won't worry about these functions. I'll just dig in and make the, um, yeah, make, the class function. So I'll just head over to the Vulkan image folder and add a source file. And I'll jump into that. Okay, so for now I just have a bunch of these. These are extra functionality that I'm going to be using. Well, let's go on to the constructor. So we're in the Vulkan image namespace, and then we're in the texture class, and we're working on the constructor. Okay, so as you can see, the first part of this constructor is literally just grabbing all the info and saving it in the file. The next part is I will call a function to load in the pixels. And then I'm going to create an image and the image memory. So 
tiling describes how the image is going to be laid out in memory. The two major options are linear or optimal. Linear means it behaves the same way an array would, you know, each pixel along, along, along. And optimal means it's up to the device, I guess, to use its own routine or just whichever memory access routine is most efficient. So as far as usage, I want this to be this image. I want it to be the destination of a transfer operation because I'm going to be transferring it over from the staging buffer that I create. And I also want it to be uh, sampled, used by a sampler. Okay. And I want to use high performance memory. So I'll be setting it to device local memory. Okay, so with that struct populated, I will use it to create the image. And then the image memory. Okay, now with the image and image memory being created and the file being loaded, I can then populate the image with the data that I loaded from the file. Um, I can then free, oops, not the pixies. I can free the pixels which were loaded in the load function. And then I can go ahead, make the image view and the image sampler and the descriptor set. At this point, the texture should be ready to use. So let's dig into the other functions. Okay, so in the destructor, well, I've saved the logical device, so I can just call it. I'll say, alrighty, um, free the memory. And yeah, we just destroy each of the resources. Of course, we don't need to worry about destroying the descriptor pool that will be handled by the main function. And yeah, okay, so that is the destructor. The next question is, how do we use the image? It's actually quite straightforward. It's a single call um, to the command buffer to tell it to bind the descriptor set of the texture. So as we can see here, I need the bind point. That'll be the, the graphics pipeline. Um, next one is the pipeline layout, which is defined up above. Then we have the first set. Now, this is descriptor set one, as we saw in the shader, not descriptor set zero. Then we need the set of descriptor sets. It says here array proxy reference. So just, we'll just put in our descriptor set. And then the dynamic offsets, we don't have those. So we'll just put in null pointer. And that's it, the dispatch is the static dispatch loader. So there we are. So that's how we use the texture. So all well and good. I'll then keep going here. So we have the load function. So let's have a look at that. So all of, all of the things we need have already been saved as class variables. So the uh, file name, whoops, we can just pass it in. Then we have um, pointers to the various dimensions, which will be populated as the image is loaded, as well as uh, the components 
RGB, for instance, and we can also specify the components that we're requesting. So this is really useful if we have, for instance, a black and white image and it only has one color component, the red channel, but we want to standardize everything. Just load it as RGB. Um, and then I'm going to test if this loaded or not. If it didn't load, then pixels will be null. So we can test that. Okay, cool. So all this does is by the time this function finishes, pixels will be populated with the data. Okay, so we load it, we create the image in memory, and then we populate it. Let's have a look at the populate function. So there are actually a lot of steps here. The first thing I'm going to do is create a buffer that I can copy the data to. So yeah, as I've said many times, what I want to do is write from the CPU, and that's what these flags specify. So this one's a little weirder. Um, before I had things like, uh, what was I? Like storage buffer and uh, uniform buffer down below. What I want to do is just a transfer source. So the only thing I'm doing is literally loading numbers into it and then copying from there. Okay, so now I guess the size will be width times height times uh, four. Because we'll have a 32-bit float for each pixel. So four bytes, and then width times height, number of pixels. Okay, cool. So now what I want to do is pixels has already been set up. I just want to copy from pixels into the buffer. So I'll map that uh, buffer memory. And then I'll use the mem copy operation to copy into there. And I'm not going to use this again, so I can unmap it as well. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to copy that buffer to the image. But first of all, I need to transition the image into the appropriate uh, layout to do that. Now, by default, when an image is created, it always starts out in, or it doesn't always, there are, there are two major options. It can either start out in an undefined layout, or it can be pre-initialized, which I'm not going to do. So I need to transition it from undefined into a, um, a layout I can work with. One layout is, um, I think it's called general, but I'm going to use, um, well, I'll show you, I'm going to use transfer optimal. So there we go. We just perform that um, transition. Now the next thing is I'm going to copy to that image. Okay, so what I then need to do is transition 
again, but instead I'm going to transition from the transfer destination optimal, which is where the image should currently be, into shader read only optimal so that it can be used by the shader. So then with that, because all these, these other um, fields aren't going to change, I only need to change the layouts. So with that done, I can then free and destroy the staging buffer. Okay, so there we go. That's probably the biggest um, the biggest piece of work that we have in this class. So there we go, we've populated the image. So um, now what we need to do, oh, I've got, so we populate the image, then the pixels are freed. Okay, then I need to make an image view sampler and descriptor set. So let's go make the image view. Okay, so I want to interpret this as eight bits for the red channel, eight bits for the green channel, and so on and so on. And I want this to be unsigned and normalized. So that's pretty straightforward. I mean, we're just calling an outside function. And to press on with things, the next bit I want to do is create a sampler. Now there is a bit of uh, boilerplate here. So I'll just bring this in. We have all of these options. A lot of them should look familiar, especially like min and mag filter. Address mode is essentially saying what happens when we go out of bounds in U, V, and W. Do we clamp to edge, clamp to border color, whatever, that's fine. And we have a bunch of other options, which I'm going to, going to just put some sensible defaults in there. I'm going to repeat. So if I go out of bounds, I'll just flip over to the next. Um, how am I saying this? You know how repeat mode works. Same as OpenGL. Um, if I go out of bounds, I just go into the next sort of iteration of the texture. Now, even though this is a two-dimensional image, we do um, specify three-dimensional access as well. So I won't be using um, anisotropic filtering just to keep it straightforward. It's, it's not too hard to enable it, but, um, we'll just, yeah, keep it, keep it clean. There's enough going on already. Okay, so for these last few ones, the MIP map mode specifies how to blend between MIP maps, I guess. Nearest is just picking the nearest level of detail for the image based on its size, and linear will sort of linearly interpolate between the two different levels of detail. I'm not really doing any MIP map stuff at the moment, so anything here would be fine. I just set it to sensible defaults. Um, so we can create the sampler and we do this within 
a try catch block. But yeah, there we have it. So that is creating the sampler. So the last function that I'm going to have for this class is the descriptor set. So fair enough, that makes the descriptor set, but I also want to perform a one-time write operation to get all of the data which was created before into that descriptor set. So there we have it. This is called a combined image sampler. And it literally, there's the combination there. All right, cool. So then I just need to write it. So there we go. And now at this point, we have created almost, almost everything we need. Um, yeah, all that remains is to fill in the non-class related stuff. So I'll just close that down. It's these functions here that we need to, uh, to fill in. So the home stretch, we're almost there. Let's just take it one bit at a time. So I'm going to implement all of these functions. I'll just go back to the source file. And we'll get into it. Now, in these functions, um, it's a lot of, just a lot of details, which may not be super important, depending. So, um, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, for these functions here, we are going to be digging into the weeds a little bit. Anyway, so I want to create an image and up above we have the description of the image create info. Um, and yeah, so I'll just fill that out. Okay, so there we have it. We've created the image. I guess not much to say here. Even though we're creating a two-dimensional image, we need to specify um, the extent as 3D. We just give it a, a depth of one. That makes sense. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and create it. Okay, so there we have it. That is how we create an image. We can close that down. And the next function is, yeah, making the memory.
Now this would be very similar to the way we did it in the mesh, um, the Vulkan mesh, where we um, get the memory requirements and then allocate the memory. Uh, I guess the thing is we're going to be using um, a different function to get the memory requirements, but otherwise it'll be pretty similar. Okay, so then we can go ahead, allocate, bind, and return the memory. All right, done and done. So there we have it. That's how we make memory for the image. All right, so the next two are going to involve lodging jobs. And to help with that, I'm going to make another um, function or another module. So I'll go to um, the Vulkan util folder and make two make two files. These will be called single time commands. Okay, so these will be involved in uh, pretty much just starting and ending jobs, which will be um, like submitted once, they're one-off jobs. Okay, cool. So these are the ones. I'll just go ahead and grab these and define them. And if I go back to memory, I think it's just right down at the bottom. Copy buffer, that's it. So if we look at this, this takes in a command buffer and the first few lines, we reset the command buffer and begin it. So let's grab all of that and put that as our function for beginning a job. There we go. Then I can just go back and and then if I look down at the last bit here, what are we doing? We end the command buffer, we submit it on the queue, and then we wait for that job to finish. So I'll grab that and that will be my end job. There we go. Alrighty. So I'm going to do the same thing with my image functions. So I'll just, yep, that's fine. I'll close that down and then I'll go and include that. And then I'll grab this uh, transition. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'll start the job. Then I'll do some work and then I'll end the job. Okay, now what is the job? Well, I'm gonna uh, yeah, I'm going to transition the layout. Now, one thing I need 
is I need to understand which bits of the image I'm going to access. So there's something called an image sub resource range, which is essentially, you know, which bit of the image are we looking at? Um, which MIP level and array layer are we looking at? So I'm just gonna, just gonna copy this in. Yeah, so I'm accessing the color bit and I'm just going with the default um, MIP level and array layer of zero. So there we have it. So the next part is I'm going to be uh, transitioning the layout and one way to do this, or one of the things that an image barrier does, an image memory barrier, is it can handle transitions. So we can take old layout, new layout, and then when we um, submit the image memory barrier, that will perform the job. So there we have it. We're using that sub resource range that we declared above to describe how we're going to access the data in the image. Now, the next part is we need to set the, where are we? The access mask and, oh, it doesn't seem to be here. But anyway, we need, we need to set the access mask and the stages other stages are, are used later on. Um, so I'll stop rambling. Here's what I want to set. I want to set uh, a variable, some pipeline stage flags. And these are the stages between which the barrier occurs. So when we get to the source stage of the pipeline, we wait for the barrier to do its job and then we commence from the destination stage, if that makes sense. At the moment, there's two transitions that we're looking at. We're looking at the transition from undefined to transfer destination. And then we're looking at the tra uh, transition from transfer destination to shader read only. So we can check which transition we're doing just with the simple if statement. Okay, so here we, again, like I said, we're specifying the, um, the stage, the two stages between, with, between which this transition occurs. So the transition occurs after we pass this stage and must be completed before the transfer stage commences. So if we're not sure about what the options are here, we can control click into this enum and we see we have all of these options. Um, top of pipe is a virtual flag, just means who cares before the, before the pipeline starts, it doesn't matter. We also have bottom of pipe, which is another virtual stage just after the pipeline has done its thing. And yeah, we have all of these options. So the point is this transition has to occur before the right operation of the transfer stage, which makes sense. And being a little lazy here, for um, full security, we should be checking all of the, the layouts to check not just the old layout, but the new layout and so on and so on. But I'm just doing it quick and nasty for now. That won't come back to bite me, but anyway. The other transfer is uh, other transition is from the transfer layout to the shader layout. So in this case, we go from transfer right to 
shader read. We go from the transfer stage to the fragment shader stage. Okay, but anyway, that should all be set up. So we then record this on the command buffer. So this is where the stages are being used. So we have the source stage mask, put in source stage, and then the destination mask. Then we have these dependency flags and we can just actually, there's a quick option here in the HPP um, header, we just go dependency flags. Right now, memory barriers, we have none of those. Buffer memory barriers, none of those. Image memory barriers, yep, we've got one of those. And that's it, I think. Yep, that's it. Okay, so then we just end the job. And super important, this end job waits for the job to complete. So we don't need to be so um, strict about synchronization of things. Okay, cool. So yeah, there we have it. We're transitioning the image layout. Okay, so just as, just as before, we'll start and end the job. And now there's this struct called a um, image, a buffer image copy, which I'll start populating. Now, if you look through here, we also have, uh, by the way, setting these to zero just indicates I'm not, I'm using pack data, which means I'm not using any special layout. It'll just grab the data from A to Z, so to speak. Um, now there's this other struct called an image sub resource layers, and that's actually pretty similar to the struct that I populated up above. So I'll go ahead and make that. It just describes how we're gonna access the data. And there we have it. We have now specified everything that we need to perform the copy operation. So we can go, yeah, copy buffer to image. Um, and we need to specify the buffer. So we get the <clears throat> source buffer, the image we're copying to, the destination layout. and the, um, a reference description of the job that we're doing. Okay, so with that recorded, we end and submit, and there we have it. So we're so close, we're so close. All we need to do now is implement this last um, function that is make image view. And I'm actually going to go back to the swap chain because I feel like I've made this already. <clears throat> yeah, here it is. So here we are filling in each of the images and views. I'm actually gonna grab all of this. It's fine, so I'm just modifying this. Okay, talking to myself. No, that's fine. I think that is all that is all good to go. 
So I can go ahead, close that down, just go back to the swap chain, make sure we are And then we can just go down here. Okay, fingers crossed. So last time I did this, it corrupted the video card and stopped the recording from working. So I'm just for uh, safety going to pause and restart. There we go. Okay. Now let's see what happens. <clears throat> I'm fully expecting a lot of errors, but that's the only way to uh, fix the code. Okay. So it looks, here's the thing. Originally when I made this, I had these as header only libraries. And the way you're supposed to do that is put a little bit um, like up here, <clears throat> like a little header flag for the header to see, to know to only implement things in one spot. And I'm starting to get these sort of issues like things are multiply defined, they're already defined and everything. Now this is complaining about descriptor stuff. So the quick fix is I can just add a new item and I will be going back and doing this eventually for all of my extra files, descriptors.cpp. And what I'll do is I'll grab everything here and just paste it. Just include that and get rid of the comments. We don't need them. We don't need the struct either. And we probably, I guess we need logging as well. This is just a, a whole lot of fun. Okay, so you can see what I've done. All I'm doing is grabbing the source code definitions, putting them, specifying the namespace and everything. It's standard stuff. So I'll just go back to the header and now I will remove it. So I've just got the prototypes here. The struct is fine, but this stuff can go. Okay. Alrighty, just close off the namespace and uh, yeah, fingers crossed again. And there we have it. How satisfying is that? We've got different meshes with uh, different textures. Of course, they all look monochrome because the, the color blending is so extreme. But I mean, oh, there's another thing I can do. What am I thinking? I can go back. I'll just go back to the scene and put these a little closer together. So I'll go back to the scene file and then I'll just halve the separation. So 0 0.3, 0 0.3, bring them closer together. And now we can see those objects closer together. Very hard to make out the textures, but hey, I mean, it is what it is. Just for fun. Why not? Okay, so the main video is over. This next bit <clears throat> is not necessary at all. Just check I'm still recording. Yep, that's fine. Okay, but just for fun, I'll, I'll make those more visible. So I'll go to, go to the engine. Just set the color to white for all of them. Okay, so for instance, here we have the triangles should now just be plain. There we have it. There's the white texture. And now the uh, squares should be plain as well. There we have it. 
how so? And um, then the stars. This will oh jeez, this will take a while. Okay, bear with me. There has to be a macro for this. You guys are yelling at me through the screen right now, right? Okay, finally. <clears throat> by the way, by the way, there is a macro for that, and that's you just remove the color attribute. But yeah, there we have it. Neroi. Okay. Uh, cool. So there we have it. In this session, we um we got textures working. Looks pretty nice. Okay. So yeah, that'll be it for now. Have fun. I know this Vulcan stuff is uh, is very cool. And yeah, I'll see you next time. All right. Bye.